Uh, yeah, I know. This stuff is crazy. This stuff is complicated. This stuff is, drives you nuts. Well, I agree. And what I'm going to ask you to do is think about this. Hmm? The most important stuff about options is in the first presentation. So I want you to go over that again, all right? But if you have no intentions of ever speculating in options or aren't ready to take the Series 7, <laughs> then you can basically forget the rest of the, the, the uh, chapter, okay? I know it's not the smartest thing to do, but we want you to learn what, is important and what is important is that you understand to stay away from options <laughs> but of course for those of you who do believe that you will speculate in options or you do want to go on into the industry or you just love this stuff which you know that's me please continue but here's what we're going to do we're going to put the questions about options that are going to be on the final on the website in canvas do you understand so that you can know what is important to know and what you're going to be quizzed on on the final exam. And so if you don't have time, there's other classes that you have to worry about, there's other projects you're still trying to catch up, you can forego the next, uh, the rest of the, the, uh, the module, rest of the chapter. All right? Now, I would go over it anyway. I don't know that it's the best idea to tell you to do that because then you'll say, hey, that's him. No, there's still going to be questions on the final exam and I'm going to give you those questions. But for the most part, the most important stuff was in the previous uh, presentation. So please make sure that you've gone over that a few times. I know calls versus puts. I know it drives people crazy. And it's one, as we said, it's one of the toughest parts of the Series 7 exam. So let's take a look at more option attributes and the most important break-even point, the very important break-even point. Slide number 17, the strike price, the exercise price. This is the contract price between the buyer of an option and the seller of the option. It's the stated price at which you can buy the security if you're buying a call option or sell the security if you're the buyer of the put option. It used to be that options were listed in $2.50, $5, $10 increments, but now you see them almost always listed in the dollar increments. Why? Because of technology. It just makes, you know, tech, the computer can operate a whole lot faster than you or I can. So that's the strike price. That's the exercise price. The expiration date on slide 18 is when the option expires. Now, most options expire at the close of the market on the third Friday of the month. Huh? That's how it works, folks. <laughs> so if you look at a January, uh, uh, it'll be the third week in third Friday in January. If you're looking at a May, it'll be the third Friday in May. And there are also stock index options and stock index futures that we'll discuss later. And... <laughs> When these things expire, it's called the witching hour because at the very end of the Friday, all these options that are still in the money, and we'll talk about that in a minute, are still worth anything, become exercised. And so the, the stock market will just uh, bump up and down like crazy. And they call that the witching hour. And if uh, the three the options, the stock index options, the stock index futures all uh, expire on the same day, which is not always the case. It's called the triple witching hour. Yeah, it's a good time to take off early on Friday and just stay away from the markets. Slide number 19, the exercise style. The two major styles are American and European. American options can be exercised at any time. You don't have to wait until the expiration date, but European options can only be exercised at the expiration. Normally, if you wanted to take a profit from an option that had done well and there was still significant time until the expiration date, you would simply resell the option instead of actually exercising the option. In fact, that's what a lot of people do. They never even actually buy the stock or sell the stock. They just trade the options. However, with an American-style option, if you really wanted the stock, 
you could exercise the option and buy or sell the stock before the expiration date. Oh, by the way, there are several other types of options with various permission provisions. Check out the Jamaican style. <laughs> Slide number 20. Where do we get the data? Well, um, you know, it, Yahoo Finance used to be awesome, but not anymore, folks. So MarketWatch does a pretty good job. Uh, search for the stock. You have to use the search uh, feature, and then you'll see options from the stock menu just above the stock quote data. And finance.google.com I'm sorry, finance.google.com works pretty well too. You know, I don't know how much I trust this data. If you're really going to buy and sell options, you probably want to get together with a broker that gives you, you know, hard and fast data. Um, we're going to put a couple of uh, presentations that will show you how to find the option data because for your assignment, I'm going to ask you to track a couple of options, call options, just to make life easy for a more volatile stock and a less volatile stock over a week and see how you would have done. Hmm? That's going to be the optional bonus assignment. So check that out. The um, list of available options contracts and their prices is called the option chain. Don't ask me why, but that's what it's called, the option chain. So you'll see that with finance.google.com. You see it says option chain, where Mark Watch just says options. And I forget what Yahoo does because I don't use it anymore, the big jerks. Slide 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. Options contracts. Now, we've discussed options contracts as if they were traded just as stocks were traded. And in most ways, they're very similar. They're supply and demand. But there's one major difference. Options are sold as contracts. Yeah, we know that because it's a contract between the buyer and the seller, also called the writer of the option, also called the maker of the option. But each contract represents 100 shares of an underlying stock, underlying security. But it, it, we say there are no odd lots, but if you really wanted an odd lot, somebody will, will, will get together with you and take the other side, but they're going to charge you a whole lot more. Um, yes, no, you want to, if you're going to play this game, you should do it in options contracts of 100 shares or, you know, 200 shares or whatever. So if, if you saw a listed price called the premium of the option was $5, then you, it's not going to cost you 5 bucks. you got to buy 100 shares, so it's going to cost you 500 or sell 100 shares. So you, you see that one contract at $5 is going to cost you $500. A contract at a dollar costs you $100. And you want two contracts, that means you're the, you're t buying the ability to, to buy or sell 200 shares. They, they're in round lots. And, of course, this is from the days when they really wanted you to do round lots, but now with technology they don't care. But just remember that. If you see... $7, that contract's going to cost you $700. If you see $3, it's going to cost you $3. If you see $0.25, cents, it's going to cost you $25. Bucks. Right. I say $3, $300. <laughs> okay. But you got it. Multiply everything by 100. Slide 22, the premium. Well, that's the real name of the price of the option because they don't want you to um, – Confuse it with the strike price, the exercise price. They don't want you to use price, but everybody uses price. But the technical term is the premium. That's the quoted price the buyer of the option pays to buy the call or the put option. The seller, the writer, the maker receives the premium immediately and gets to keep it whether or not the option is ever exercised. Did I mention that most options expire without being exercised? I, I, I think I have. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, to make it more confusing, the term premium is also used in a more precise manner when valuing options. For this reason, most people almost always refer to the price of the option instead of the premium of the option. They don't confuse it with the strike price. They know what that is. They know that that's the exercise price. That's what price we're haggling over. But the... Um, price of the option, that, you know, that's only a few bucks or sometimes more depending on the option. 
Slide number 23. Okay, in the money and out of the money. Well, what a silly name. Are you in the money? It's a song, right? But if an option is in the money, that means it has value above the fact that it that you can turn around and uh, turn around and sell it for something else. And in the money call option is a call option with a strike price less than the market price of the underlying security. So let's say the strike price, the exercise price is 50. You can buy that that stock. Let's say it's a stock. Let's just use stocks for, to make life easier. You can buy that stock from your from your buyer from your seller of the option, the other party the uh, to the contract for 50 bucks. But if the market price were 54, then you're four dollars in the money. Does it make sense? Look at the graph. I think it makes sense. The market price is fifty-four dollars, right? But we can buy that for fifty. We have that ability. We can tell the seller of the option, "Hey, you made a deal. You're going to let us buy the shares for fifty bucks." So you're four dollars in the money. Now the option would sell for more than four dollars usually. Why? Because there's more time for the uh, stock to go up. But of course, if the stock went down, that right, exactly, we could wind up being out of the money. And what's out of the money? Well, the call option has no real value other than the fact that you have time left for the stock to move. The call option has no real value because the strike price exceeds the market price of the stock. If you had bought an option at, with a strike price of $50, an exercise price of $50, and the stock were selling for $47, why would you? Oh, that's not right. It should be three dollars out of them. I gotta fix that. Let me write that down. Sweet. <laughs> slide number twenty-three. Um, if you if the market price were forty-seven dollars, you wouldn't exercise the option. Why would you buy a share? Why a stock at fifty bucks when it's selling for forty-seven? So your um, call option is out of the money. Now, is it worthless? Well, it depends. Remember, there's still time left for the stock to go back up and go above 50 so your option will go up but remember there's a time limit there's an expiration date and the same thing is true <coughs> on the other side fifth slide uh 54 sorry no slide 24 i'm sorry slide 24 i'm looking at the numbers here if you have a put option and in the money put option means the strike price is greater. Everything is in reverse. Doesn't it drive you nuts? That's what options drive people nuts. If you could put a stock to somebody, sell it to them at 50 bucks, and the market price were $46, then your option is $4 in the money. Because you could turn, just today, right now, you could buy that share, those shares for $46 and turn around and sell them for 50 You see that? Pretty cool, huh? Now, that's an in-the-money put option. And an out-of-the-money put option is exactly the opposite of what calls are, what the call out-of-the-money call option is. That's because the market price is higher than the strike price. You wouldn't, right, exactly. You wouldn't sell a stock to somebody for 50 when the market price is 52. You'd sell it to them for 52. So this put option which allows you to sell the stock at 50 is out of the money now is it going to have some value yes because there's still time left for the stock price to go down in which case your put option would become in the money if it fell below 50 dollars so again take a few moments stop and go back and look at those two slides because it doesn't it drive you up a wall yes it does these are options and they're tricky and they're gambling and stay away from them and, but we got to learn them because we're going to be the uh, the um, investment guru for our friends and family and we're going to warn them not to get involved in this world because it's gambling and they could go to vegas and have a better time maybe i don't know slide 25 now <clears throat> here is a theoretical view of what happens with an option with a strike price of fifty dollars if the stock price is less than the strike price well then you know it's a wash right yeah nobody earns nobody loses as soon as the stock price goes above the 
uh, strike price, now the buyer of the option starts making money. And the seller of the option, the writer, the maker, starts losing money. So theoretically, for every $1 above the strike price, the call buyer earns a dollar and the call seller loses a dollar. Now this is a $50 strike price. And let's, let's just say for, just for ease of use, that the option price, the option premium, is 10 bucks. Okay? Well, remember, the option wasn't free. <laughs> so slide number 26 shows you what really happens. The previous graph ignored the price of the option. So the call buyer had to pay 10 bucks. So right out of the bat, boom, he's lost $10. She's lost $10. And the call seller has gained that premium. Remember, the call seller gets to keep the premium no matter what happens. So right off the bat, what we see is once we hit the strike price, the $50 strike price, then the call buyer starts to make money, but not until they hit what's called the break-even point. The call buyer has to have the stock go up as the has to have the stock go past this the strike price plus the price of the option before they start making money. So this is a ten dollar option, which is you know a little expensive for options, but some some are cost more than that. And so he or she has to see the price go above fifty and then go above sixty before they actually make any money. It's called the break even price. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. If you had to pay $10 for this darn thing, you've got to hit 50 plus 10 or $60. It's called the break-even price. And the same thing is true for a put option. So again, ignoring the price of the option. See, everything's reversed. It's like a mirror. If the stock price is above the the exercise price, well then, you know, you know no big deal. Nobody earns, nobody gains, loses. But the, as soon as the stock price goes below the exercise price, the strike price, then the buyer of the put starts to make money and the seller starts to lose money. Theoretically. Well, you got it, right? The buyer had to pay for the option. Again, let's use $10, which is not necessarily the best number, but it, it makes it nice and easy round number. So again, here, the buyer of the put is out 10 bucks. They had to buy the option. The seller of the put made that $10, gets to keep that. Now, as the price goes below the strike price, then the seller starts to lose money and the buyer starts to gain money. But the, again, they, it has to go below the strike price minus the price of the option before the buyer actually starts to make any money. You see, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to be a buyer of options. If I ever get involved with options, I'll be a seller. But even then, I'm never going to do it. I don't think I'm ever going to do it. I don't know. Maybe someday if I get bored when I'm not teaching anymore. I don't Well, Yeah, don't do it, folks. It's gambling. Unless you like gambling. If you like gambling, fine. You can do it from your living room, right? From your from your uh, your bedroom or whatever. Or on your phone. On the go. Ooh. Slide number 29, <laughs> the time premium. And this is the, remember we said we, we use premium a little bit more uh, precisely. This is the amount by which the option price exceeds the options in the money value. Remember we said a stock, a, a stock option will have an in the money value if it's a call option and the price is uh, above the strike price. And if it's a call op, put, put option the other way, below, you know, the, the mirror. But remember, uh, there's still time left. There's still time left. And there'll be an extra amount to that uh, in the moneyness. Um, that's what they say, in the moneyness. <laughs> I, I didn't make it up. And because, the, there, because there's more time for, for things to go your way or not go your way. If the option's out of the money, then the entire price of the option is due to the fact that there's still time left, the time premium. In other words, an option that is in the money will sell for more than the amount that is in the money because of the time remaining until the expiration date. 
often an option that is out of the money will still have some kind of time value, time premium. The option still has time to become worth more as the underlying stock's price changes. Yeah, in other words, people who are buying out of the money options are basically just w hoping that they have enough time for the stock price to change. Mm -hmm. Slide number 30. And don't forget commissions. In the previous examples, we did not include the cost of commissions. A commission is charged whenever an option is bought or sold, and both the buyer and the seller pay a commission. And a commission is charged when and if the buyer exercises the option and buys or sells the stock. Again, both the buyer and the seller pay a commission. So when you include commissions, it makes it that much harder to make money in options. But if you're a broker, <laughs> you see, you want to beat a house, right? You would simply love to have your clients get hooked on options. Yeah, because you're going to be generating commit. Well, not you. The, the client's going to be generating commissions. And uh, disclaimer, proscript, whatever. None of my clients trade options. And if they wanted to, I'd do my best to talk them out of it. And if they really, really, I mean, if they really were that blind that they want to lose their money, they need to find a different broker because I'm not interested in having people lose their money. It's just, it's not, it, it, it it's so bizarre, right? <laughs> It's not my money, it's their money. Why should I care whether they lose money? It it makes me, it just makes me, <laughs> I, I, I say I treat it like it's my money, which is not the best thing to say. You know, people think, you what are you doing? You're taking their money? No, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't like to lose money myself. I mean, I have the stock market, you're going to lose money. But I hate to lose money frivolously, and that's what you do when you, when you, stocks. You might win, folks. I wish you luck. You might just win. You probably won't. And uh, don't say I didn't warn you. But hey, it's your money. Just don't tell me, all right? I get upset. All right, so now time for another break because I noticed stuff is... Um, mm -hmm. So when we come back, we're going to take a look at options strategies <laughs> and some of the most bizarre things you've ever seen. But you got to know them for the Series 7. And you have to know them just because you're the investment guru for your friends, family, and coworkers. And when they say, this guy told me I can make money with this travel, just say, go away. Just tell him this guy is trying to get you to get hooked so he can make his commission. See you in our next presentation. We take a look at options strategies.